Hello and welcome to this History, Politics, Government Hangout live on air. This is part five of that series called Government, History, Politics, etc. <laughs> you can join if you want. Um, and this is the second section of anti-war through the years. Now in the first video, can't decide if I'm hot or cold here. Okay, a cold front coming through, you know. <laughs> In the first video I did, the, uh, it was called Anti-War anti Through the Years, and I went from the War of the American Revolution or the War for American Independence up to the American War on Spain, or as people call it, the Spanish-American War. But probably more accurately, the war against Spain in order to grab Spain's land. <laughs> okay. Uh, we. We want, we want to be honest with these videos. Um, your response might be, don't you want to be popular? I'd rather be honest than popular. I like to be popular because I would like to get the ideas out and naturally you say, well, you're just spreading propaganda. Of course, we want to propagate the ideas. We want people to adopt the ideas. That's what propaganda is, right? Anytime you try to persuade somebody of something that's propaganda, and I'm using the, I'm using, how you like how, I'm drinking the Corona Familiar, which is a different recipe than Corona e Extra. At least it is now. It may have always been, but they weren't clear on that. Corona Extra is 4.6, whereas this one is 4.8 isn't a great difference but it is a difference and it has higher ibus well i don't know what the ibus are for corona extra i think they're not too high i think they used to show that on the um, crown imports website that website is sort of like defunct now this one's 19.5 ibus not exactly a hoppy beer but hoppier than relatively more hoppy than your average okay but on to the show so, you know, I'm enjoying it. It's a little, I say on with the show and then I'm talking about price. It is a little high for the price. Uh, the price is a little high. It's like $3.72. Golly gee. Oh, well, you know, it sells. So you can charge what you want if people will buy it, right? I can't say it's an unfair price because no one made me buy the, the item. A dollar eighty-six for a pint beer, a regular beer. I don't know about that, but um, don't tell me it's an unfair price because I'm not compelled to buy it. It's not a necessity. Demand often drives up price, but we're going on with the war. So we go to nineteen hundred. Oh, did you know the United States had a war against China in nineteen hundred? The Boxer Rebellion. Oh, yes. Uh, well, what happened here was there was an uprising in China by a secret society that did this. You've seen the exercise routine in China. But people thought they looked like they were doing shadow boxing. So the Westerners, the French and the British and the Germans said, what are these people doing all this boxing, shadow boxing? So they call them boxers. Uh, and they spread their ideas all around China and they planned that they were going to have a big uprising and kick all the foreigners out because, and this guy, uh, one of my viewers wants me to do a video and I said next month I will about the opium wars. I'm no expert on the opium wars, but there's a kind of a cut and dry theme theme for that. But uh, we'll get to that. But the opium wars led to the breakdown of China, the Chinese empire, the Qing dynasty or the Manchu dynasty, which had been in power for for a long time since. Um, what was it 1644 or something like that? But they were from Manchuria, so the Chinese considered them foreigners. I know Manchuria is owned by China, but at one time 
it was like a different country, you know. And uh, but anyway, they felt like the Manchus were weak, and they were they were letting the foreigners take over, and the British and the French and the Germans and the Russians were setting, and the Portuguese were setting up colonies inside of China, like making China give them, or in some cases maybe putting pressure on China to give them territories. Macau to the Portuguese, um, Hong Kong, Hong Kong to the British, and then later the New Territories, which became part of Hong Kong, and then the Germans had territories, and the Russians, and so they got they had this idea they're going to rise up, and they had built big signs that they made called that said "Kill Foreign Devils." <laughs> They also felt that Christianity was a Western influence in China was corrupting the people away from Confucianism and Shinto, uh, not Shintoism, excuse me, Confucianism and Buddhism and all that. Well, so they launched a revolt and they just started killing foreign, as they said, foreign devils, killing people everywhere. The, the empress of China, well, they had an emperor, but he didn't really run anything. The uh, dowager empress, that's the emperor's mother or grandmother. I can't remember. It's not important. She was saying, uh, oh, yeah, I don't know about these rebels. But when it looked like the rebels were going to win, then she says, uh, oh, yeah, um, I'm behind that. <laughs> kill off, kill foreign devils, you know, and China declare war on the world and all of this. So, But then China was living in a world of delusion. For, for decades and they were very weak and once now what the western countries did the americans did not have a colony in china but they had sort of like what you say reservations like special areas concessions where americans were protected by american law and all this business and they made a movie about that with charlton heston you could watch it uh well, once the international community, kind of like the early, kind of, sort of like an early United Nations, okay, they all got together, made this coalition. And, and they were killing Japanese too, by the way. So Japan, the United States, Italy, France, Great Britain, Russia, Germany, the United States all teamed up and sent a relief force to rescue the uh, foreigners that were under siege and had not been killed yet in Peking, Beijing, Peking. Well, guess what happened to China when there was the counterattack? Oh, uh, their magic spells didn't work and the bullets went right through the shields and uh, they got routed and uh, they got defeated. And then China was put under much more serious restrictions and had to pay a big indemnity to the, all these countries, a big penalty fee. The Empress Dowager was figured that's it. The, the gig is, you know, the jig is up, and then she ended up dying, and then her, the new emperor, the little kid, he ended up getting thrown out of power in 1911 by a secret society of Chinese revolutionaries that were Republicans. They wanted to set up a republic, which they created in 1912, the Republic of China, which is still in power today, but only on Taiwan Island, Kinmen, Matsu, and the Pescador Islands. So, but that government is still and the capital is Taipei, although they claim that they're the, the real government of all of China. But we're not getting into all the Chinese internal politics, okay? You say, why are you bringing that war up? I mean, it was like a little war, you know, one of America's little wars. Not too many casualties or anything. Well, you could say, well, should the United States have had concessions over there? It was sort of like quasi-imperialism, yes. Did the United States have a right to rescue American citizens that were being threatened, whose lives were being threatened by this wild rebel group? And then when, of course, when the Chinese government comes out on the side of the killers, yes. <laughs> We would agree with that. Okay, so fine. But then you know the story. So the British say, oh, no, no. 
we don't like the Japanese and the Russians and the Germans trying to shut down China for themselves. So we want to make sure we can trade in China along with our junior partner, America. So, but you know how the British used to always do, they would come up with a policy. What did I say used to do? Uh, they will come up with a policy, but then the, they would tell the Americans in secret, well, you present the policy because you're the land of the free and everybody thinks you're you know, standing up for freedom. Because if we do it, they'll say, oh, these British bulldog imperialists, you know, oh, okay. So the junior partner, uh, Secretary of State, John Hay, issues the open door policy. We demand an open door for trade in China. And so then, well, guess what? The United States starts getting slowly sucked into Chinese internal politics. And 41 years later, gets sucked into a war between Japan and China because the United States decided they're gonna enforce the open door policy, a British policy, against Japan and so, Okay, well, okay. Now, we're not talking about trade between countries. We're talking meddling and affairing, getting in people's business. So you see these things are all interrelated. A rescue team, good. Trying to control trade in East Asia and be the police of the world, not good. <laughs> Who does this? The Anglo-American axis, the, we're, we're, we've been talking about this Anglo slash American whatever word you want to call it, world empire or whatever. Which begs the question, why did the US even bother breaking away from Great Britain if they're going to be joined to the hip with Great Britain and basically work in concert to control the events of the planet? I don't know, it's a good question. Um, you tell me. Uh, you might say, we had to fight against those British because you know they eat all that bland food and they make terrible television shows, which we always copy and re rebrand. <laughs> or whatever, whatever reason we had to break away from them. I don't know. They their music is too pop or you know, I don't know. Whatever. I don't know. Okay. They eat too much jelly or something. All right. So so well, we know the United States broke away from Great Britain and then became their junior partner. Now the senior partner, I don't know, whatever the case. They're still joined at the hip. They have that special relationship, as they call it. But let's get on to the next. So you say, oh, well, yeah, but I'm bringing it up because that, that kind of lets you understand why that there's this American policy. You know, like some people say, why is the United States so like involved in all these countries' internal affairs and got troops all around the world, always fighting these endless wars? Because that's what the British Empire does since 1689, okay? And if you're an unofficial part of that empire, <laughs> you, we're not a Commonwealth country in a technical sense, but in reality. So uh, you're gonna do that, right? If that's what you do, that's what you do. Okay, well, let's go on. So. Uh, well, say, what about these little wars like occupying Nicaragua, occupying Guatemala, occupying um, all throughout the 1900s, you know, Haiti a bunch of times, um, the Dominican Republic a couple of times, all the way up to 1989 or oh, 83 invading Guad uh, Grenada, 1989 invading Panama, attacking Colombia to grab the... and to grab and create Panama so they could build a canal. What would the anti-war uh, viewpoint say about that? Obviously, we would oppose that because it's blatant imperialism. The United States had no uh, interest in going grab these people's land or occupying their land. Oh, and I forgot to say, to say Cuba. And we don't support it. all those little minor wars. Minor to us, but if your child got killed in Panama in 1989, it wouldn't be minor to you. You understand? Or if your your father died in the Dominican Republic in 1965, then it's not minor to you. You see? 
Okay, so but that's, and let's include Mexico, this uh, adventure of Woodrow Wilson trying to start trouble with Mexico in 1914 and uh, seeking an opportunity to go after them, which he did at Veracruz and then sent, and then you had troublemakers down in Mexico like uh, Pancho Villa and he wanted actually to draw the United States into the war so that he could, uh, he could take over control. So, uh, but they wouldn't have been on, they probably, I can't say for sure, but they probably wouldn't have been any of that, the Pancho Villa raid on New Mexico and all that, if Woodrow Wilson hadn't had this pet project to tell Mexico who their president need, needed to be. Now, you see what I'm saying? Woodrow Wilson decided he, he could, in his mind, he could determine who would the president, who would be the president of Mexico, and he couldn't understand why these these Mexicans resented this. <laughs> All right, um, so obviously we wouldn't support that. Now we're going to go to the big stories, right? The big stories, not Corona beer. Uh, interestingly, Mexico, not uh, what we said, the minor wars, but the big ones, the biggies, <laughs> like Archie Bunker said, the biggies. Uh, the world war. That's what I call it for the last at least 10 years. The world war part one, 1914 to 1919 really. The world war part two, 1939 to 1945. And the world war part three, 1944 to 19, uh, to today, what am I saying, I, to today. So we've basically had three sessions of the World War. World War One, as they call it, World War Two, as it's popularly called, and the Cold War, 1944 to today, not always so cold. Okay, well, all right. Now, if you have any comments, please feel free to make them. And if you wanna join the discussion, feel free, as long as you're not insane and you can let other people talk. <laughs> uh, and you control your language. So let's look at the First World War or the World War Part One, really. The same, really, the same war since 1914, 104 years ago. Hans Gomez says hi. Hello, Hans. Thanks for watching. Uh, so 1914, what happens? This long simmering feud between Great Britain and Germany, Instigated, instigated by Great Britain, I might add, but uh, you know, I'm not taking sides. I really, I'm not taking sides. I'm just calling it like it is. They had this beef against Germany since eight, well, around, let's say, 1890. Okay. It built up because it was a bunch of different interrelated European conflicts that everyone predicted was going to explode into this huge war. Now, this is not like it caught Europe by surprise. Everybody was predicting it pretty much and dreading it, but yet the countries at the same time were preparing for it. They thought to their detriment that a system of alliances would make them safe. Now, as we know from the study of history, the alliance system actually made them much more unsafe and put the countries in terrible danger of getting sucked into a war that was never going to be in their interest, might be in someone else's interest. So the British want to go after Germany, right? So they say, oh, well, we ain't going after them alone. The British always are more than happy to get someone else to fight their war for them. And it usually works out, usually works out their way. All right. So they start lining up people against the uh, Hohenzollern German Empire. Russia, who sh was really a natural ally of Germany, they should have been teamed up all along or just at least getting along with each other, not necessarily in all lines. They, they lined up France and Russia against Germany, east against west. You know what I mean? East and west against the middle. Because Germany, remember, in 1914, stretched literally from Germany Germany. Germany stretched from Russia to France. That's how big Germany used to be. It used to stretch from France 
to Russia, okay? Because Poland was under the control of Germany, Austria, and Russia, all right? <clears throat> all right. Germany gets paranoid. But see, they could have just avoided the conflict by just saying, well, we're neutral. We're not going to fight anybody. We're like Switzerland and Sweden. We don't have any, any enemies. We'll just trade with you. We'll make all our German gadgets. And we can buy French wheat and corn and uh, escargot. And then we can buy British steel and we can just be a big you know and you see if you don't take the bait what they're going to do right so um but germany was ruled by the prussians basically which was very militaristic and extremely hot-headed and paranoid you know so when the british start plotting against them you know they get paranoid and the prussians when they get paranoid they would get crazy you know they would the Germans like to eat sausage, you know, and dance the chicken dance, you know, and smoke pipes and uh, make little intricate gadgets and write poetry about Sturm und Drang and all that and make music, orchestral music, you know what I mean? But they're weird, you know, because they, When they get paranoid, they get crazy. You know what I mean? They, they're they very dangerous because they, so they start getting paranoid, you know? Oh, the British are out to get us. Oh, okay. So they fall into that trap, you see? They, so they start building a big, we're gonna build a big Navy. We'll show those British. So the Germans start this naval program, which never was that successful, really. And the British say, oh, okay. No. You got to remember, they're dealing with the masters. The British are the past masters of plotting against people. So it's like, okay, you got to realize what you're doing here. Well, you know what happened. So they built this huge army. They built this huge navy. They got all these countries in alliance with them. But what countries? Italy. Oh, wow. Great. The weakest of the great powers. <laughs> oh, boy. And Austria-Hungary. Another ally, a country that hasn't won a war in, uh, well, uh, try to think of a time when Austria ever really won a war. You know, you know, think about that. You can't really find one, right? So you're teaming up with a football team that's like 0-12. They field a team, they compete, they always lose. I mean, sometimes they win, but that's because everybody else came and helped them, like against the Turks. Anyway, all right. Oh boy, what a team you've got. And the Turks, they're going to try to drag the Turks into this. I mean, not a strong country. In 1514, yes, strong. In 1614, still strong. 1914, not strong. Weak, going down. So Germany, um, got really paranoid and they get into the, okay, so, you know, Gavrilo Princip gets shot and people said that's the cause of the, I mean, he, sh he gets shot. He shoots the Archduke and people say, uh, oh, that started the war. Well, that sparked the war. It didn't start the war. I just told you what started the war. Maxwell says, hi, Ron, how are you doing? Glad to see you in Moscow, negative 20 degree weather. Oh, it's it's warm here. Sorry about that. I, I am warmed by a can of beer a beer can of Bud. Oh, Bud. Oh, yeah. In Europe, it's Bud, not Budweiser. <laughs> so, okay. We're going too deep into this. Okay, so these other countries might have fought little wars. No one cares. Okay, no one cared if Romania fought Bulgaria. Okay, no one cares. All right. No one cared if Italy fought Austria. I mean, literally, no one cared except those countries. Believe me. Uh, now you're writing in Russian. I cannot read Russian. Uh, Cyrillic. But people did care if the British or the French or the Russians are going to get involved. Oh, now it's a big problem, you see. How many do you drink 
of beers, uh, okay, in one firm, you're saying how many a, a day? Oh, uh, it's 22 a week, okay? 22 per week, not a lot. Okay, let's just get, we're going too long. Okay, so the Europeans start fighting again in this big old war, all these white people fighting each other, which is a, a, you know, it's like a shameful thing. They should have been teaming up to be friends, right? So that's shameful. Like people always say in America, this black on black violence is shameful. Black people should not be killing each other. I, just, I certainly agree with that. It is shameful, black lives matter. Totally agree. But of course, white lives matter too. And it is shameful for these white countries to be fighting against each other. Horrible, should never happen. They should, they should be working together as friends, trading, getting along with each other. They're sending all these young people out to die for what? Because uh, somebody wanted to occupy Bukovina and other country didn't want them to. And like you never, you never heard of these territories and you can't find them on a map. So you're going to go charging out of a trench to get shot with a machine gun because of some conflict in a region you never heard of. Does this make sense? What's up, bro? Oh, just talking about history and government, anti-war. All right, so you say, well, thank goodness the United States didn't get involved in that craziness. Oh, wow, well, well, that's the whole topic of the video, you see? We got a little problem. The problem is called Woodrow Wilson. Heard of him? Well, you see, <laughs> Jimmy M says, Europeans fighting each other is like a pastime of their, unfortunately, for a long time. Yeah, pastime. Bad hobby. Well, you see, Woodrow Wilson had this little curious, very close relationship with the British establishment. Uh-oh. Guess you know what that means. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> he's going to be plotting to get the U.S. involved. But he's got to figure out how to do it because... 90% of the American people say, oh, no, we're not going to go fight those European wars. All right. How can we get now? There's a bridge in Virginia named after him. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, how can we get the Americans involved? Oh, here's the way. Like we got involved 102 years before in 1912 through trade, the argument of free trade on the seas. Oh. Now, you see, if these countries are fighting, right, and you choose to go send your ships over there and send weapons to either or, or side, common, kind of makes sense that the other side is going to try to stop you from shipping weapons to the other side, right? The Germans don't want you trading with the British and the French, and the British and the French aren't going to want you trading with the Germans. Common sense, right? Now, Oh, but there's so much money they can make. And these American tradesmen, capitalists are so hot for the money. They start sending American ships into Europe like you could not believe. And they are making so much money. And But the only problem is they're getting all of the money on credit. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's right. The British, the French, the Italians who joined in 1915, <laughs> they're buying everything on credit. Of course, the Germans were allowed to buy stuff, too, but then naturally they could never get the supplies because the British Navy was the strongest in the world and they could never get anything through the blockade. So how are they going to get new supplies? Germans had an inferior Navy. So what did they do? They start using the Unterseebuch, the submarine, to try to even the score. Going to sink a bunch of German uh, British ship, ships, a bunch of Italian ships, bunch of French ships, and then eventually, that doesn't work, they tell the Americans, stop sending your ships over here. If they enter the war zone, and we find that they are, uh, you know, shipping supplies, well, they could be commandeered. Now, you see, Woodrow Wilson was very indignant. How dare you stop our ships? But oddly, <laughs> the British constantly did that, you see. The British routinely would board American ships and quarantine them or search the ships for war material. But you see, Woodrow Wilson, he don't want to see that, of course. The British read all the American emails. Well, you know, they had email back then, but it was called uh, Telegraph. Same thing, electronic mail, you know, same thing. The British were 
hacking into it, if you want to use those terms, it really is the same thing. They're hacking into it and they're reading it. Okay. And all these bad things happen. And there's one incident after another that is trumpeted by the press, the New York Times, et cetera, all pro-British, all part of the establishment, all wanting to get in the war, all set up. You say, it's terrible for you to say that. It is terrible to have to say it. It's all true. So this big problem, okay, propaganda machine gets in going in gear and the American people start to say, we have to protect democracy. Right, like Germany, who can't win the war. Now, let's use some intelligence here. Here's Germany. They can't win. It's 1915, 1916, 1917. They have not won. They obviously are not going to win. Maybe they'll get a peace treaty or something, but they obviously aren't going to win. But then they start to spread this fear like they could. Could we be next? <laughs> now, like, how are we going to be next? They haven't even taken over Paris. What are they going to do? Send some ships and occupy New York City, Baltimore, Atlanta, Georgia, and New Orleans? Uh, right. Okay, so people fall for the joke or the scam, I should say. And so in 1917, April, the United States declares war on Germany. By the way, a country that never sought to fight America, right? Has no desire to fight America. Knows that they will lose if they fight America. You hear what I'm saying? So, you know the result. The Americans jump in the war, which is basically a tie, but turning against Germany, kind of, whatever, you know. And so, of course, Germany lost. Austria-Hungary it, uh, you know, their little junior partners lose too, uh, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and uh, the Ottoman Empire. But it's all about Germany and it's all about Great Britain and France. It's not about these hanger on countries, okay? If you're from Bulgaria, I'm not insulting your country. I'm talking about what counts and what don't count. Did you know Guatemala declared war in Germany in, during the war? You think that counted? All right. Uh, so the Germans were very resentful. They say, oh, well, here's these American bastards, you know, they, they intervened in this war. We didn't want to attack these people and they jumped in anyway. You know, you can imagine how angry they were, you know, uh, if Wilson wanted to get involved in a war so bad, why did he wait until 1917? That's an easy thing to answer because in 1914, nobody would have gone along with it. You have to cultivate the fear. You have to cultivate the hysteria, Jimmy M. Okay. It took years to get people sufficiently wound up. And it was not a unanimous vote to go to war with Germany. Now you had people in Congress that were brave enough to vote. No, this is a scam and we're not going along with it. So, uh, you know, it took a while. It took uh, over two years to get the Americans involved. So it wasn't an easy project for Wilson to pull off, but he pulled it off. All right, I'm going to go get some water. I'll be right back and we'll finish this up. So, uh, So now let's go to the big one. Okay, gotcha. Okay, Jimmy. Feel free to ask ask any questions. I'm not defensive. Now let's go to the biggie, right? There's still veterans alive from the big one, World War II, but um, not many because it was 70, 73 years ago. Now, um, okay, the war broke out again, basically, 1939. They start fighting again. We can make a two hour video about the causes. Okay, we could go into all of that. Once again, the British are fighting the Germans who 
who don't really want to fight them because they'd rather, well, you know, I don't want to go into all that. Okay. Cause the whole thing was total stupidity really on a lot of people's part, Stalin, Hitler, the Poles, the British, the French, it was a whole lot of people being stupid. Okay. A lot of people being stupid. Now you say, well, how does that affect America? I don't know. You tell me because, uh, but then you see this time the Congress was wise to it. So they say, hold on. <laughs> All right. The Congress say, hold on. We know Roosevelt is from New York. He's got these close connections to the British. And so there's a much stronger, even anti-war sentiment in 1939. We're not getting hustled again now. So Roosevelt's going to have hell, you know, to get people. Maxwell, the only album I ever heard from Kraft, Kraft work was Autobahn, okay? And I have two copies of it. All right. So Roosevelt's got to really be careful, you know, because it's hard to pull these things off twice. You know what I mean? So he's got to play it real careful. Now, but they got a boogeyman who's Hitler, right? Talks loud, got a funny looking mustache. The media hates him, you know? So it's, that is an advantage that Roosevelt has. And then you have the New York Times and the whole New York establishment, New York City establishment. And so they, they get people nervous, you know? Okay, so, all right, Hitler, he's, He's bad, you see. He's like the Kaiser. You know, the Kaiser was like the Hitler of 1914, 15, 16, 17, 18, like this evil man that wanted to take over the world. And if you're ignorant, you believe that. Average technician says Germany got shafted after World War I. You could say that. Okay. Uh, but that's what happens when you lose. Um, okay, so... But they, now there's movies and there's radio and television is just getting started, but it was no factor at this time because television got put on hold in 1940 with the war coming, you know, so you would have had major television in the early 40s, but as it turns out, it got delayed to the mid to late 40s. Okay, but anyway, forget that. All right, um, but you still got movies and radio and newspapers, which are very influential. And so the, they're able to cultivate over time this fear Oh, you see, Germany might take over America, which is our joke. It's a joke if you use your brain, because here's Germany once again, World War II, caught in between Russia on the east, who for two years was their partner, but a very untrustworthy partner, as we can see, and then France on the west, Great Britain on the West. And so they're caught in the middle again in a very bad situation with their Italians on their side this time. Probably better to have them as an enemy, really, <laughs> as bad as they were. Uh, and and uh, there's this whole, and I've read all the propaganda, in, oh, not all, but so much of the propaganda from 1939 and 40 and 41. Oh my goodness. Germany might take over America. Now, imagine how that could happen. Here's Germany, who can't even go a across a 30 mile English Channel. Got me? They can't make it across a 30 mile English Channel to invade Great Britain. Can't do it. But we're told that some how they're going to come across the entire Atlantic Ocean and invade America with an inferior Navy. Now you can imagine <laughs> it now, you, but you see the anti-war crowd, the so-called isolationists, they had much more power in 1940 and 41. They say, no, 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 no one's falling for this. You see, so Roosevelt couldn't really get people to go along with it. You see, People say, no, 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 we we fell for this trick in 1917 with the Kaiser, this big evil guy, you know, the Antichrist and all this bull crap. And then all these Americans got killed for basically nothing. 
And now you're trying to drag us in again, you know, and we're not falling for it. So he's caught, you know, but you see, there was an advantage because of the Japanese situation because there's two things going on at once. While you got the Europeans, the white Europeans killing each other again, a disaster. Over in the East, you got the yellow race killing each other. Japanese versus the Chinese. We don't want to get into the whole history of it, but we could, but we're not. I bet you can't guess who decided to inject themselves in the conflict. Oh, right. You guess. How did you guess? That's right. America. <laughs> Let's see what the comments say. Ron, where are the family, the children and the wife? Do you live one? Do you have one? My child is at Alabama going to college for a master's degree. My wife is not here at this present moment. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Now you can use your imagination. Logan Wilmot says, do you think there are any similarities to the way the mainstream media of today drives the conversation on policy with the media propaganda used to influence their respective populations of the day? Uh, yeah. During the wars? Yeah, like it's identical, really. I would agree with that sentiment, Logan. Murica says air compressor. <laughs> I don't understand what you're saying, Maxwell, how many years? Let's not worry about my personal life. That is irrelevant to this topic. If I'm married, not married, got 10 kids, a child, no children. If I'm a, a secret gay, home, you know, if I'm secretly a homosexual, if I'm really a woman dressed like a man, none of that matters. Let's forget all that. Logan Wilmot says, in other words, gun control, Russia, drug policy, et cetera. I don't know. They're always steering the masses towards something the, Muppet, the puppet masters want. Right. How about Putin as a president? Oh, well, I think Putin is a very good president. Best they've ever had, but let's get off of that. Just pour the old man winter southern tier beer. Oh, yeah, I love that thing. Going to sit back and listen to what you have to say, says Moulin Roots. Okay, all right, so let's go on with the story. Let's not get off on these little side tangents because they're not productive. I mean, I'm bad enough about that. Okay, Japan and China are fighting a war. That ain't nothing new. Bet you can't guess who decided to get involved. Oh, well, you guessed, the United States. Well, how did you know? Remember that thing I talked about in 1900, the open door policy? We got to make sure nobody interferes with trade and policy. There's your entrance. The United States tells Japan, we're not going to let you close the open door. Don't you know we're the world police, <laughs> us in Great Britain, the Japanese? Now, if you thought the Germans were paranoid and hot-headed, <laughs> let me introduce you to the most paranoid and hot-headed people on the planet. <laughs> um, so the Japanese tell Roosevelt, stay out of our business. Leave us alone, okay? Just don't bug, don't bug us. Well, that ain't going to happen. You're dealing with Roosevelt. He's not going to stay out of your business, okay? He's going to continue to interfere with your business. So the United States says, okay, in 1940, we're going to put sanctions on you. We're going to embargo you to an extent to try to hurt your economy so that you can't fight China. So the Japanese, they very clearly told the United States, look, Let's get something straight. If you put sanctions on our economy to try to hurt our country, we are going to take, we are going to consider that an act of war, okay? They, they said this publicly. If you do this, we are not going to take it. And you could take that any way you want. You better watch it. Well, 1941, and by the way, the, the war with China was not going well, okay? Japan was not winning the war. But that's another story. They screwed up. They were stupid, okay? Anyway, kind of like the whole theme of anti-war, war does not pay. <laughs> 1941 comes along. The Japanese get an agreement with France to occupy all of Indochina. So Roosevelt puts a, like a total embargo on France. No steel, 
no sales, no sales of steel or war material to Japan. So the Japanese say the Japanese get ticked and they say that is it. I mean, you can look at the newspaper articles. I've got them from before the Pearl Harbor attack. The Japanese said, look, get this straight. If you do this, this embargo against us and try to destroy our economy, we guarantee you it ain't gonna end up nice. We consider it an act of war and we are gonna respond in that manner. Now you can figure out what we mean. Now the Japanese said this repeatedly and he was not gonna back down. Roosevelt said, I am not gonna back down. That will not happen. So you looks like you're just going to have to suffer. Then the Japanese said, oh, OK. OK. Now, <laughs> we're sitting over here in America playing video games like a bunch of idiots, right? You're dealing with Japan in 1941. You were dealing with some serious people. They are not playing games. So they said, all right. And they decided that's it. We're going after them. And the British too, because they're right in on it. They're right in on it. The British and the Americans are like the same country. So they want to play rough. Let's play rough. But you know, the Japanese are smart. You know, they can build cars and stuff and boats. Mostly they stole the plans from the British and other countries, but it's okay. All right. So the Japanese say, oh, all right. So, you know what they did? They made the sneak attack. They, you know, they put on that little show, like, let's negotiate. Of course, the Americans were reading all their secret codes, so they knew they weren't really going to negotiate. So they were, like, playing this little game with each other. The Americans say, yeah, let's work it out. Let's work it out. And the Japanese say, yeah, let's work it out. When they both, both sides knew they weren't going to work it out, which is where that conspiracy theory started that the, um, Roosevelt knew about the attack. I don't know about that. Whether he did or not, I don't know. Don't ask me. I don't know. All I know is it worked to his advantage. Now, you always have to ask the question, who did this help? No. You got Churchill, who was hot to get the Americans into the war, but he never could get it figured out. I mean, he basically got the Americans in the war. I mean, by 1940, the United States was in the war against Germany, and it just got progressively worse. They were in, in an unofficial war against Germany, okay? Even the Germans were telling the United States, why don't you stay out of this? And the United States said, no. And what are you going to do about it? And Hitler said, well, uh, nothing. Because what could Hitler do? Declare war and lose for sure? Because by 1941, Hitler was already losing. I mean, let's wake up, people. They were already losing the war, and their chances of winning were not good. So, like... Hitler was thinking, like, what am I going to do? Fight the United States? I'm already losing. I'm going to, that's like uh, defeat probable, which is the situation without the U.S. actively involved, or, or I should say officially involved, versus defeat guaranteed. So Hitler was in a bad position, right? By 1940, he was facing defeat probable or option B, defeat guaranteed. Now, so they had that over there kind of in hand. And then the Japanese, they say, OK, I'm going to keep basically throwing darts at you. And I dare you, I dare you, I dare you to respond. I dare you to respond. Well, remember, the Japanese will always take a dare. We're talking about 1941. There is no way you are going to throw arrows at them and they are not going to respond. And Roosevelt, you know, he knows they're hot headed and Churchill knows that they're hot headed and they could be manipulated into like the South in 1919. I'm sorry. 1861. I mean, Lincoln was smart. He knew that these Southern people were hot headed. And if you threw darts at them, there was no way they weren't going to shoot back. Go to South Carolina today and start trouble in a bar with somebody. I guarantee you they're going to come at you. Okay? They they weren't going to take that then and they're not going to take it now. I'm talking about just the average person. 
in South Carolina. And so the Japanese were not going to take it. <sighs> so, you know, da da da, ding dong, they attacked. Well, how how you like that? And so, well, we don't we know like they said on the old radio show, we know the rest of the story, right? I mean, a a, a a brainless wonder could figure that out. The most powerful countries in the world defeated other countries that were powerful, but not really that powerful. <laughs> so Germany and Japan got beat, disastrous losses. And uh, once again, there's a lesson, don't get involved in a war because chances are it's not gonna turn out too well. <laughs> and so the anti-war position, should the United States have gotten involved in World War One? Obviously not. Should the United States have gotten involved in World War Two? Obviously not. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like the same theme. You get the theme, you're catching on to the theme. Logan says, do you think the Japanese presume they could win? Uh, I think they presume they could win in 1937. They were very stupid in that sense. They, they thought if they attacked China, they could win. After about a year, I think they had doubts. After two years, they had big doubts. By 1940, they were scared. You know, their economy was being destroyed by this war. All kind of thousands of Japanese men were being killed and they were in a trap and they couldn't get out of it. Uh, so did the Japanese presume they could win? No. I think they presumed that they had some kind of chance to perhaps get a peace settlement, maybe. But that was very heavily argued within the Japanese high command and their government. You had a lot of Japanese telling the emperor and the prime minister, this is craziness. Why are we doing this? Because we're not gonna win and we're being baited and why are we taking the bait? And they're just gonna wipe us out. It's The whole thing is a setup and let's just forget it. And you know, by 1944, or really way before that, it was pretty obvious that they weren't gonna win. They fought furiously, but it seems our Navy was simply more sophisticated at the time. Yep, that's right, correct. Do you think that there are reasons for this miscalculation by the Japs? Well, yeah, I don't think they miscalculated so much. Some of them did. Even the ones who miscalculated realized it was a major risk. They were not thinking like this is a sure thing now, but they were just mad. Like a lot of them, were, they were just mad. And they just figured, you gotta, you gotta understand their mindset. Their mindset was screw them. We don't even care. They wanna mess with us, we fighting back. I mean, it's crazy, right? Like why wouldn't you just take it? But that's their mindset. They mess with us. You know, it's like uh, Sonny in that movie, The Godfather. They hit us, we hit them back. Bada bing, bada bing. That's their attitude, you know? And then uh, you got the other side, like Son uh, like um, Tom Hayden saying, but we gotta be careful. We gotta deal with this. We gotta look at all the situations. We might get beat. And the Sonny was saying, look, just help me win. So that was the Japanese mindset. They hit us we hitting them back. Okay, now it turned out to be a disaster, but that was what they they wanted to do. And as we know, it turned out terrible. Why did they drop the second nuke on Japan? Both were overkill in my opinion. Well, I mean, the first one was overkill. Maybe they wanted to send a message to Uncle Joe over there in Moscow, right? Alex, the beer master says, says, what's up, Ron? Oh, just finishing up this talk. Uh, they fall on a sword if they feel they betrayed someone for Christ's sake. Right. So you're dealing with people that are not like us. They don't necessarily mind dying, but yet you know that. So you can provoke them, you see? That was the whole thing about Roosevelt and Churchill. They knew what buttons to press. They study these people's culture and they know who are the hotheads and they can they can press the right German buttons and get them to go off and they can press the right Japanese buttons and get them to react. You see, so you can get people to react. You can make it, you can make them the bad guy. You see, that's very clever, right? Okay, well, we can't go into a part three. 
or a session three, but that's okay because uh, Aaron's going to have to wait on the Opium Wars, <laughs> Aaron Chan. But we, we can do that, Aaron. Aaron. The Opium Wars is important, certainly. It has a lot to do with what we're talking about now, the downfall of China and all this. But that's not the main thing we need to worry about. But the Opium Wars are bad, and I agree. We're, we'll talk about it. The Japanese attack a military base and the Americans attack innocent civilians. You're doing good, says Aaron Chipman. Oh, yeah. Things are so bad that we will never see peace time again. Always going to be at war with someone, says Travis Harper. I don't want to be negative. I don't. I think with the Trump election, there is hope. I didn't say a lot of hope, but you see, because that was the whole thing about Trump. There was that inkling or that little little crack of light that maybe everybody's not all geared up for war. And that's why he's under so much pressure from the establishment, you know, because the perception of Trump was that he really was anti-war. He wanted to make peace with Russia, right? He wanted to make peace with China, have this big world trade or trade, a real world trade or organization and try to end the empire and all that. So you saw that full bore attack from the New York establishment say, we've got to get Trump out of here. He wants to upset the apple cart, you know? And so uh, we saw that they really went after Trump starting in August of 2015, because here's a guy that does not think we should have peace through war, you know? So he rejects the whole, in a way, and we don't know, but in a way it seems like he rejected the whole American empire uh, idea, you see? And that's why they, they went after him so badly that, oh, he curses sometimes, he he tells dirty jokes, he he doesn't do his hair right, you know, all this really inconsequential stuff. But the real reason we know is because he seemed like he didn't want to fight Russia and he wanted to make peace and he wasn't under Israel's thumb like he wasn't uh, in their pocket. So that really caused a lot of the consternation, we know that. Uh, Aaron says the Japanese attacked a military base. That's right, Pearl Harbor. They didn't attack civilians in general. There were a few incidences, but it wasn't an attack on civilians. The atom bomb attacks was against a civilian population on purpose. Okay, that was actually, but somehow that's not a war war crime. I guess if you, I don't know, it's if you kill people with gas, that's really bad. But if you kill them with a radiation bomb, it's not bad. Something I don't know. It seems like they're still dead, but I don't know. Uh, all right, Logan says opium wars also about free trade, right, right, as the British framed it. Jordan says skull or cheers. Hey, air compressor say he treats the military very well. I would be very happy if I had a president that was trying to keep me out of a war. But you know, Trump is a, uh, you know, it's it could go either way. You know, he could. He could be influenced by the, the jingoists, the imperialists, to go over to the uh, dark side. <laughs> and maybe he's going over to the dark side. But uh, in 2015, it looked like he was not part of the empire, right? He lived in the empire, but he wasn't part of the empire. So that's why we see all that antagonism towards Trump, you see. Alex, and, and that might have been some of the reasons they wanted to get rid of Nixon, you see, Richard Nixon, because it looked like he might be trying to get rid of the Cold War. Oh, no. <laughs> Air compressor say he treats the, oh, Alex, the beer master say, hey, Ron, did Adolf Hitler call it World War II? Oh, well, I think everybody called it World War II back then, yeah. Yeah, pretty much everybody called it that. It's just a common term. So on the next installment, <laughs> part six, really part three of this sub-series, let us look at the Cold War. All right, anti-war during the Cold War. And what does that mean? Well, you know, all the trouble that started with Russia in 1944, really in 1915, but I mean, really in 1815, but you didn't hear that from me. All the trouble that started with Russia in 1944, really 1815. Um, and that still goes on today, the get Russia policy. Um, and did the United States fight Russia? Well, yeah, in Korea and in Vietnam, 
in the Dominican Republic, in Lebanon, <laughs> and um, Afghanistan. And then we'll we'll talk about the uh, American adventures, <laughs> the adventures in Iraq in 1991, 1991, the American adventures in Iraq up after that, up until today, <laughs> the American adventures in Afghanistan and all the other countries, all these wonderful adventures Oh, well, I mean, yeah, they might bankrupt the country. They might get a lot of people killed, but think what it's doing for the world. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It doesn't do anything for the world except hurt the world. Oh, well, why nitpick? Uh, so uh, what did we learn today? <laughs> United States should not have gotten involved in World War I. Very obvious. The United States should not have gotten involved in World War II. Quite obviously not. Trotsky bowed out and still got his head split with an ax. Uh huh. Uh, he didn't exactly bow out. He got out, but he continued to cause his problems in Russia, you see. He was at odds with Stalin. And Stalin got Trotsky before Trotsky could get Stalin. Oh, but that's okay because all the Trotsky's people came to America and started the neoconservative movement. <laughs> so uh, even though he got his head split open, or didn't he get stabbed with an ice pick? I don't remember. In Mexico City in 1940. But Lev Bronstein's people are still here. They're still trying to destroy America. Okay. All right. Well, that's it. So anti-war through the years. We went from 1900 to 1945, and that's 45 years. That's no little quick. That's pretty good. I had feelings we wouldn't be able to make it all the way to today. But we'll try to do in the third round, we'll try to look at the events of the last 75 years. Well, that shouldn't be too hard, but it probably will be. I appreciate people watching. I appreciate your comments. And I appreciate any interaction, so we'll discuss it. It's very interesting. Thank you for watching this video production.